<laughs> um, so how do we do it then? What's what's the what's the what's the basic idea from the theory side of how you actually go about now? Well, I'll give you a I'll give you a a, a special bonus with this. I'm going to give you the steps to getting passenger pigeons back, and it, along the way, I'm going to tell you what we've already accomplished, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to take a just put it put it out there of what we still need because. Um, you know, we, as, as Revive and Restore as a nonprofit organization, we rely completely on donations from anybody around the world can donate. Um, but even more so than that, you know, we do not have a laboratory in a building. We, we're not that, we're, we're a small office of people that work with partners. And so there's a whole host of science that we still need on these projects, you know, that, that bioinformaticians and other people around the world could help us out with. All of our data is open access. So anybody in the world could be working with us and contributing. Um, we don't necessarily have funding to just go ahead and hire full time staff on some of this stuff. So we really rely on collaboration. Um, and you know, with that going into it, what we do is first step, sequence the DNA of the passenger pigeon. We have done that. Um, starting in 2013, we wor started working with Beth Shapiro. She's a world-leading paleogenomicist, um, and I worked in her lab for four years. And we sequenced the genomes of two passenger pigeons, um, and we sequenced small bits of DNA from like 30 more. We got DNA from 4,000-year-old pigeons and pigeons from the 1600s, most of them just from the 1800s. Um, and we published those genomes in 2017, cover story of Science Magazine. All of our data is on GenBank. Anyone can access that. Um, so we, we created the data sets. We did some preliminary analyses. We know, you know that there's about a 3% difference between a band-tailed pigeon and a passenger pigeon. We also know, you know the structural changes and some of the other things that are important. Um, a few years later... so. I should say that, of course, we also sequenced the genome of its living relative, the band-tailed pigeon, to be able to do that comparison. Um, a couple of years later, uh, uh, Ares, Aiden Lieberman's lab updated that genome for us, so we have a really nice, high-quality uh, band-tailed pigeon genome that is, once again, open access. Anyone can download this stuff and start analyzing passenger pigeons and band-tailed pigeons. Um, the... In the meantime, while we were building up that genomic resource, so you need that to be able to figure out the blueprint, but you also need the two other steps, of course. The next step is doing the gene editing in the cells in a Petri dish and then taking those cells and turning them into embryos and offspring. That's really, really difficult in birds. Um, and I'll, I'll explain why in a moment. Now, step three, of course, is then breeding your birds and putting them back into the wild. And we've done a little bit of work on kind of every step of the way. So putting them back in the wild, of course, relies on knowing stuff about their ecology, how the animals breed, etc. So we've done preliminary work, uh, studies of how band-tailed pigeons breed and grow up. Those are published. Um, uh, that was uh, done by workers at the Bronx Zoo with a flock of band-tailed pigeons. Um, we also uh, worked with some band tail pigeons with a volunteer, Paul Marini, um, who was the first person to show that you could actually get those birds to breed out of season. So you could actually produce more offspring per year than just through the breeding season, which is going to be really instrumental for us later on. Um, and we also studied their diet and, and started piecing together how that would impact forests, things like that. Um, so, and all of that's published. Most of it is open access. If it's not open access, anybody can get a hold of me and I will send them the PDFs. Uh, my email is on reviveandrestore.org. Um, so it's just actually reviverestore.org. You can find my contact. Um, so we've built the genomes and what we need from there is we haven't been able to figure out exactly what genes might be involved in what traits. We know what traits we care about. We care about traits that affect social behavior, uh, coloration, um, the speed of development, um, possibly diet and physiology, but really it's behavior and how quickly they grow that are the main two things we care about. So can, I ask, yeah. can I ask quickly, you, you're not looking to, it sounds like you're not looking to re recover that entire 3% difference, only a smaller portion of genes which are relevant to the conservation. Oh yeah, you know, if 
it's likely that it's 0.01% of that that creates the passenger pigeon as it was in the environment. Um, the, uh, you know, changes just accumulate over time. You know, between you and me, there are thousands of mutations that are different, but we're both human. Mm -hmm. um, if you compare our DNA to a chimpanzee, you know, there's going between you and the chimpanzee, there might be a few million differences. But when you add me into the picture, some of those differences are no longer differences between humans and chimpanzees. It's just you as an individual versus mm -hmm. the chimpanzee, right? So, so what we're really looking for is one, those sets of mutations that are just between the species. And then recognizing that over 12 million years of evolution between these species, a lot of that has just accumulated. It doesn't actually influence any trait. So we have to sort through it and try to figure out, okay, well, what, have, what you know, it's, it'll cost a lot of money and time to try and make 25 million mutations in a genome. If only 300 of them create the behavior and the physical traits and the things that we need, you know, that's what we're trying to find. So, you know, it'd be great to get collaboration with people around the world interested in answering those kind of functional genomic questions from our data so that we can start building that blueprint. Um, in the meantime, I was working actually in Australia for two years, and we had a, a mix of very great work and disappointment. We, we said, okay, we're going to genetically engineer pigeons for the first time using technologies that exist right now. Um, and we did not produce a genetically engineered pigeon. That was the disappointment. But we did develop the protocol necessary to be able to, be able to do it. So what that is that means work is, continuing down in Australia, or is it? It is. It is uh, done for now. Um, um, I've moved back to the states for family reasons, and so that that work will eventually continue. But I'll, I'll get to that. Um, is so to do de-extinction for birds, we need to be able to culture something called a primordial germ cell. Okay. Um, it's the only cell type that you could do gene editing in, and then produce offspring afterwards. Um, for mammals and other species, you can use skin cells, you can use stem cells, all kinds of stuff. But in birds, you have to have the germ cells, the cells that will, in the adults, become sperm and eggs. Okay. Um, and the, the conditions to be able to culture and keep those cells alive in a laboratory has only been accomplished for the domestic chicken. And the recipe that keeps chicken cells alive has so far failed to keep the cells of any other type of bird alive, probably because of how long it's been domesticated and how much it's been changed through domestication. So, so to do this, we need to be able to grow band-tailed pigeon germ cells in a Petri dish. Um, we're actually starting that work right now. That work is ongoing at Texas A&M, but with a different species of bird called the... Uh, pinnated grouse. Mm -hmm. um, it's the living relative of an extinct bird called the heath hen that we're working with, and they're in the same family as the chicken. So we're, we're, we, we, you know, we know this works in chicken, so we're kind of we're inching out evolutionarily um, to try and figure out how we make this work in wild birds before we end up going to pigeons. So can um, I ask, you're then going to have ultimately a band, two band tail pigeons, a male and a female, which yeah. produce uh, these primordial germ cells? Yes. Yeah. They'll, they'll have, so we put those, so in the Petri dish, we've got the band tail pigeon primordial germ cells, assuming we have all the collaboration and help we have from scientists that we need that once again, shouting out anybody that wants to work with us, email me. Um, we'll put those mutations into those cells to create basically new passenger pigeon germ cells, then implant those germ cells into a male and a female, as you said, and the male will produce passenger pigeon sperm, the female will produce passenger pigeon eggs, and we breed them, and then out of the egg hatches the passenger pigeon. Now... So this, I, I don't understand one, one, one part. So are the primordial germ cells the sperm and eggs themselves, or the cells no, that no, no, produce they're, they're the cells that they're the cells that produce So they're the part of the, the testes eggs. and, and yeah, eggs. Yeah. Okay. yeah, they're the very first cells that form in the embryo uh, that, that, that basically become the reproductive uh cells i see so so you 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 start yeah. off with an embryo you yeah. you alter that embryo so it produces a bird which has these uh the, the sperm cell producing uh testes that you want 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean a good way of thinking about it is um, through it, like thinking of in vitro fertilization in people. Mm-hmm. You have a, a donor father and a donor mother, right? You collect sperm, you collect eggs, you make an embryo in a petri dish, you then put it into a surrogate mother. If you think about it in the realm of birds, you have a donor father and a donor mother, but you're getting the germ cells from, from them when they're embryos, when they're, still, when they're still at an embryonic state, a stem cell basic state. You're then, rather than making an embryo from those in vitro, you're implanting that into a surrogate mother and a surrogate father, and then they make the embryo the natural way. Um, and so it's, so it's, it's best to be thinking about it in terms of like donor cells and surrogate parents. Um, it sounds like these, one of the positive, yeah. uh, things there is then those engineered parents can produce multiple. Oh yeah. You don't yeah. have to keep doing it by hand, right? They're just exactly. There. Exactly. Once you have a breeding pair, um, and that's what some of our previous research has shown, like a single breeding pair, we might be able to get 30 to 50 offspring every year out of and they'll live for and breed like like pigeons can live up to 15 to 20 years and they 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 breed really well for about five to six eight years or so so yeah we can get from a single pair of these birds we can get a a few hundred offspring Um, now the other cool thing is you can put germ cells from multiple donors into the surrogate father or mother and basically use a single pair of birds as if it were an entire flock wow okay and it's so like they those could lay trees with multiple branches spliced onto them. Exactly, exactly. So like a single pair of these surrogate parents could lay two eggs in a clutch, and those eggs are not even siblings genetically. Mm. You know, um, it's so you could you could. You know, there's a lot we can do with that, but we have to be able to culture the cells to get there. That's the big problem. And where I said where our work in Australia was positive is we were not working with culturing the cells. We were trying to ed- engineer the cells inside the birds. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's a technique that works, but it's just, you cannot, you cannot scale it up to the needs of de-extinction. Um, you know, you can make like maybe one change at a time and we need to make hundreds, right? So, um, and it's, it's a long laborious process, but the mechanics of it are exactly the same. So when we have our cultured primordial germ cells, we have to take a, uh, an egg, a fertile egg, cut a little window into it, inject those cells into the developing surrogate mother or father, patch that egg up, incubate it, hatch it. And the thing about a pigeon is unlike a chicken, it is helpless when it's born. It absolutely needs parental care. So either a human being has to raise that baby, which is incredible amounts of labor, or you need to get a foster pair of parents to do that, which is not always so easy. So, so that entire process of opening up the egg, making an injection, incubating, and then raising that baby, that is the system that we developed in Australia for the very first time in pigeons. People had tried before and they had failed. So we were able to take domestic pigeons, open up their eggs, inject a new gene into their germ cells, and it did work. It just, I'll, I'll, it didn't work as well as we wanted it to. Patch up those eggs, put them under a foster pair of parents to incubate. Um, or so, sorry, not no, sorry. We incubated them artificially, and then when they were ready to hatch, we were able to transfer them to a foster pair of parents that were sitting on dummy eggs. And then those parents accepted the the offspring as their own and raised it to adulthood. We raised a total of twenty four um, pigeons that way. Um, and as I said, no one in the world had ever been able to do it before like that. So. Um, basically we've shown that we know the, the animal care system and the egg handling system to be able to make a passenger pigeon when the day comes, but we need to now develop those other resources to plug in the, the gap. So we've got basically in our three steps of sequencing genomes, doing the gene editing, making the embryos and returning to the wild. We've got, um, we've got genomes, we've done a little bit of analysis, but we need help with more. We do not yet have the cells cultured to be able to make them, but we're starting that work with a different species and working towards that. Once again, if there are laboratories in the world that want to try working with bantail pigeon cells, we do have a flock of those birds that we can start uh, using to get cells to to do that work. Um, So anybody that wants to 
put their time in. Once again, you're welcome to collaborate. Um, we do have the process to be able to make the manipulated birds. Um, and we do know a great deal now about how to breed them and how to care for them and how to, and where possibly to return them to the wild because of our ecological knowledge. But what we need there, of course, is going to be, as you said, the, the regulatory partners and people to start navigating once we're downstream. We need zoo partners and captive breeding partners to be able to scale up and produce a lot of birds for restoration. Um, you know, when we get down to that downstream part, we're talking about needing hundreds of people on board on this project with multiple institutions. Whereas, you know, at the earlier stages, we can get by with a few dozen people working on this. Hmm. So, so it sounds like getting a few hatchlings is, is a vastly different problem to having a viable population at the end. Exactly. You know, yeah. So, you know, yeah, making the first couple dozen birds is something we can do at a single facility. And, but eventually, you know, you're going to run out of space. Um, can I ask, um, you know, let's imagine everything goes perfectly that the dream scenario unfolds at this point. Um, you know, how many years do you need and what sort of funding do you need to get that first clutch? You know, to get to that first clutch, um, you know, in, in truth, we're probably looking at, let's see, well, I'll break this down. Um, a donation somewhere in the, uh, uh, or accumulation of donations somewhere in the one to $1.5 million range would be enough to cover about maybe three to five years of work on the primordial germ cell part and, and m developing that system in pigeons. The majority of that cost goes to caring for a flock of birds, right? So, I mean, I mean, to actually, you, you have to have your band tail pigeons and your other surrogate pigeons before you ever have passenger pigeons. Um, so, um, you know, and in parallel, if we then bumped up to say like maybe two to $3 million in parallel, we could then possibly hire on some bioinformaticians and some staff to really full time be, be looking at these genomes, um, and, and developing the, the, uh, blueprint for how we're going to do the gene editing in these cells. And really once we have the cells and a system that works to produce offspring and, and a series of, you know, known genes to change, we can rapidly start creating the bird. And at that point, that's when we need to possibly either partner with existing zoos and facilities or build some new facilities to start breeding those birds and preparing them to go to the wild someday. And at the same time with that, the regulatory, you know, people don't consider this, but going through the regulatory pathway costs money. It's people's time as well as application and, and, and networking costs that come into working with the regulators to go, okay, well, you need form A116 or whatever, and we need to have a public comment period. You know, it costs money to bring people together in a town hall meeting, right? So um, in truth, I think in, if we had um, a donor right now from anywhere in the world that really just wanted to see this happen, if we had a 15 to $20 million donation, upwards of $25 million all up front, we could produce the first passenger pigeons in less than 10 years. That's um, actually pretty cheap. I mean, <laughs> yeah. On, and, on, and that on would be covering possibly, funding. yeah, yeah, exactly. Not, you know, after that point, the, the maintenance and breeding, et cetera, I mean, for conservation programs that breed animals, it's several million dollars every year. Um, you know, the California condor program has been an amazing program that has taken a species that went to the verge of extinction and has repopulated it back into the wild. It has been going on for, you know, they, they captured the very last one the year I was born. So they've been doing this for 33 years and, um, you know, they spend two to $4 million every year, um, running that program, but it employs hundreds of people. Um, you know, so it, it, it's one way to look at this as, yeah, there's a cost to it, but it's also producing economic, you know, exchange at the same time. So, um, yeah, I mean, as you said, like the overhead of this is definitely more expensive than most conservation projects, but then it becomes kind of basically the same as every other conservation project in the long run. And I believe with 
that kind of money, like 20 to 25 million, we can build the right type of breeding facilities at the right areas to be actually be able to rapidly expand this population to get it to the wild sooner, to get to a sustaining wild population sooner than most other programs get the chance to do. Um, but yeah, and you know, we could be looking at wild passenger pigeons sometime in the 2040s or 2050s after mm-hmm. building up a large enough captive population and going through all of that regulatory work. But once again, every step of this not only relies on having that money, but just having support from the public that want to see this happen. To me, I, I'm really hoping that this is something that an entire generation of Americans and people from all over the world, every culture, First Nations people, uh, uh, immigrants, you know, people born here, uh, every creed, every religion can actually look at and go, you know what, this is something really worthwhile to get behind. Um, and, uh, you know, we're not doing this for profit. We're not doing this to advance any type of corporate gain. You know, we're, we're doing this because we want to see something happen that's beneficial in the environment. And so far, our donors, you know, have kept us going on the, on the kind of a collaborative, you know, way. I will say that the de-extinction programs, Mammoth and Passenger Pigeon, are, are virtually shoestring budget projects. The majority of Revive and Restore's work where we get the most support is for, uh, is for endangered species. And in this year, we've been able to actually kind of grow to twice the size we were. We are now a funding agency. Not only are we spearheading our own projects with, with species, but we're able to actually support projects around the world that, that match and align with our mission. So we can kind of be a funding partner rather than just a funder and, uh, and maintain kind of a community of these genetic rescue uh, conservationists. And we convene meetings. You know, there's a lot of things we do that is changing the way conservation is thought of as a paradigm and, and how people are approaching the, solu- the, the problems they have to develop solutions. And th- that ranges from just using DNA data, genomes and sequencing, to make better decisions about how to breed animals for restoration or to move them in the environment for reintroductions or augmentations um, to populations to where to protect habitat, where, you know, where is the primary place where people, where, is, where they breed or where they migrate, um, all the way to, you know, using gen- gene editing to allow a species to overcome a disease. Or for, we've got, we've actually got, I think, seven or eight now different projects, all a part of what we call the Coral Reef Advanced Toolkit. And these are people that are just looking at the fact that it's predicted that mo- almost all of our coral reefs that we, you know, like the Great Barrier Reef is what I mean. Like many of our coral reefs will be gone by 2050 Mm -hmm. um, because of climate change. And so there are people looking at every possible tool they can use to start fixing that. And it turns out that, you know, even just discovering how to save coral reefs is difficult because no one has really ever made them really easy to work with in a laboratory. Mm -hmm. So our toolkit is all about actually just enabling the discovery. We got people working on generating coral stem cells, people working on um, how to cryopreserve uh, fragments and cells and samples of corals. People, uh, we were funding people to actually spread existing methods that they've developed to train groups around the world. There's a laboratory in Florida that has been able to have great success in being able to uh, induce breeding in captivity. Uh, which is huge because to date, most labs in the world, if they wanted to work on embryos of corals, had to go out while the species were breeding in the wild and collect them from the wild or wait every year until the one day in the tank they release their eggs. And so to be able to induce that whenever you need to mm-hmm. allows people to actually do work all year round versus once a year. So, um, and then, you know, uh, and we've also had people studying you know, can you use pharmaceutical drugs and other things to actually simulate the types of things that are happening in the wild so that you can start figuring out how the transcriptomics changes when, it's, when a coral is stressed? What genes are at play? Is it the symbiont or the coral? Um, and so we've got a whole host of work working on reefs with that. Um, we now have, uh, you know, uh, uh, oh. You know, I think I, one of the, yeah. good, the good things is uh, once you have a clutch, I think that's the point at which yes. the, f- the floodgates will open. For many years, you know, recently there was a detection of gra- gravitational waves. Those groups that were working on those detections for 
years were getting very little funding. But as soon as you, they had that first detection, now there's there's oodles of funding in comparison to before. So hopefully yeah. that also happens in your case uh, one, once well, you do is, get that, that first what, five. Uh, you know, that brings us back to that American chestnut story is that um, William Powell, you know, when they started their work, um, lots of people were telling them this is pointless. Um, you'll never succeed. And they had a, there was another program going on in parallel where they were hybridizing American chestnuts with Asian chestnuts, hoping that they could produce a strain um, and then back cross it and produce something that's mostly American chestnut, but inherited the mm -hmm. immune system of the Asian chestnut. And, you know, both those programs have been going simultaneously. And, you know, it, it, the results end up speaking for themselves. And William Powell said, you know what? Success is what breeds support. Mm -hmm. Like, like people might not be able to see your vision and, and, and people might not be able to get behind, oh yeah, we got to come overcome this barrier, this barrier. But once, yeah, once they see the birds in a nest, you know, once there's a press release to the world going, Hey, look, we've got a couple de-extinct passenger pigeons that look the way we wanted them to look that are behaving the way we wanted them to behave. Yeah. It's pretty hard to look at a living, breathing organism and then get caught up on your qualms about other mm -hmm. stuff. You know, when people finally saw the trees that were resistant to the disease, it was like, okay, you've got something here. You can do this. And it just so happens that, you know, in the 30 years it took for that to work, the people doing the hybridization, they, you know, they had some partial success, but they haven't been able to produce trees that are as resistant to the blight as William Powell's group did. Mm -hmm. And that was actually, you know, they've, they've come together as an entire program just with the goal of saving chestnuts rather than competing with each other for who's going to have the best solution. And I think that's another key thing I love about the conservation space is, is unlike biomedicine and agriculture where you have competing interests, corporate, you know, uh, uh, interests and, and patents and whatnot, is that people really can come together and work in parallel and say, you know what? Yeah, maybe there's three or four solutions to this, but our goal is all the same. We want to save species and their habitats. And, and so there's always room to actually work together in conservation. Escaped sapiens. 